the sky this month with your host, Dave Redon. Welcome to the sky this month. I'm your host, Dave McDonald, and this is January 2024. Happy New Year, everybody. It's a new year, and we've got some great celestial delights to talk about. We're going to do the format just a little different for this show. We're going to start off talking about the night sky and constellations and stars and planets that you can see. And then in uh, just a little bit uh, later on, I'm going to be introducing to you Tyler Flanagan as a special guest. And we're going to be talking about the latest and the greatest with the James Webb Space Telescope. But uh, right now, we're going to talk about what's up in the sky that you can see from your own backyard. That's where you find the greatest show on Earth, and you don't have to go very far. Sometimes a little drive to a darker place, a dark site, uh, might be helpful. So I want you to know that at January 2nd, Earth is closest to the sun. And then it's in July, around July 4th, that Earth is furthest away from the sun. And you may ask yourself, well, that doesn't make sense. But think about the people in the southern hemisphere. It's kind of opposite for them. But as far as the whole planet goes, we are closest to the sun in January, January 2nd. About uh, 91.4 million miles. And then we get as far away in July as 95.6 million miles. So on average, we're about 93 million miles on average, which we consider to be one AU or one astronomical unit. Now, something else happening at the beginning of the month are the quadranted meteor showers or meteor shower. So late night, January 3rd, early morning, we're talking like after midnight to like 4 a.m. Uh, on January 4th, so that's late Wednesday night to early uh, Thursday morning, uh, look towards the north. Anywhere overhead is going to do the trick, but a little towards the north as the quadrantids take place a little bit between the Big Dipper and uh, Buotes, the upper part of Buotes, the herdsman, and uh, enjoy another meteor shower. Dress warm, go out and uh, have some hot chocolate and some donuts and a lounge chair, sleeping bag, whatever to keep warm and uh, hopefully you'll see some cool meteors. I hope that you got to enjoy the Geminid meteor shower uh, last month. And we also had the Ursids last month. So what we're looking at here behind me, and I'll just step aside to reveal January 8th. This is early morning before sunrise on January 8th. And now look at what I have just revealed. Uh, we have the Moon, Venus, and Mercury. Mercury's tough to see. It's uh, what we call a morning star, even though it's a planet. And Venus is a morning star, even though it is a planet. Venus, you can't miss. It's blazing bright. Mercury's tough. Uh, binoculars will be a big help to you to find Mercury. But this is the layout uh, early morning around uh, 6.30 or so, January 8th. And I chose January 8th, one, because Mercury is as far above the horizon as it's going to get for any given time. And the moon is in the picture. It's not a full moon. This kind of looks like a full moon here. But it's actually a uh, waning crescent moon as it's going to be approaching towards the sun. But a beautiful view, great camera opportunity. Get your phone out and take some pictures. But uh, early morning, you know, the 7th, 8th, 9th is all going to be fine. This just happens to be uh, a picture of what it's going to look like, or it did look like, on January 8th in the morning. Okay? So now we're going to jump ahead to January 14th. And what we're looking at here, now we're looking in the western sky. Obviously, Mercury, Venus, and the moon was in the east. Uh, before sunrise, now we just had sunset, and this is around 6 o'clock at night, looking southwest, and we have the planet Saturn and the moon. And once again, the moon is depicted here looking full, but it's really a, 
uh, a waxing crescent moon making its way towards first quarter. But this is a good uh, evening to check out Saturn in relationship to the moon. Saturn is at a magnitude 0.9, and the uh, diameter, as you look at the planet itself, is 16 seconds of arc, and it is going to be dwindling is a little bit as we get further and further away from Saturn, down to 15 seconds of arc, which isn't really a noticeable change. And then from uh, ring edge to ring edge, you're looking at something in the realm of 36, uh, what we call seconds of arc, seconds of arc. So the ring tilt, as you look at it, is about nine degrees. So it's a great time to look at Saturn and enjoy the moons. There's four moons that you, you'll be able to see. Titan uh, is further away. And then there are a few others that are a little bit uh, closer that you can enjoy. So uh, let's, the next image I, I want to show you, th this is the artwork of the constellations. And so just to show you that Saturn and the moon, again, this is uh, evening, 6.30 or so, 6 o'clock on January 14th, and you'll notice that we're in the constellation of Aquarius. Now every night the moon moves from west to east, so the moon is going to be moving in this direction about a fist's width uh, from night to night from west towards east, and, and, it's, uh, and as I said, it's in the waxing stages, so you're going to see more and more of the moon lit uh, each night. But Saturn is going to be still hanging out in this area of Aquarius. So speaking of the moon, I, I want to show you uh, an image. And this image of the moon here is around the 18th of January. And it looks like pretty much what we have here is the first quarter moon. And we see the terminator line. The terminator is that line that separates the nighttime on the moon from the daytime on the moon. So there's really no dark side of the moon. We have a daytime and a nighttime side, and we have the near side and the far side of the moon. Sometimes people confuse the far side of the moon with being the dark side, and it's not. All parts of the moon have equal day, equal night in the course of a moon. Now, if you have binoculars, you might be able to barely make it out with the unaided eye, but if you have uh, binoculars, I want to point out a couple things that you can see first quarter and beyond as we continue to wax towards full moon, which is about another week away. So we have the head. Do you see a soccer player? I want to show you the soccer player here. All right, we have a ball. We have the head, the body, kicking foot, and we have the ball. So the head is the Sea of Serenity. The body of the soccer player is the Sea of Tranquility. Then the kicking foot is the Sea of Fertility. And then the soccer ball is the Sea of Crisis. So my psychology lesson to help you to remember these seas, which are not filled with water. Once upon a time, that was the thought. Since Earth came from, sorry, since the moon came from Earth, and Earth is 74% water, then these dark spots, they, they must be oceans or seas or maria on the moon. But we learn later, no, that's not the case. They're actually dried lava beds of basalt is what the darker material is. And the lighter material is called a northrosite. But the head of the soccer player is the sea of serenity. Isn't it nice when you have serenity in your mind, in your head? And then the body is the sea of tranquility. Once again, it's nice when you have tranquility in your body and you're kicking the crises out of your life. The ball is the sea of crisis. So a couple of identifiable portions of the moon. And as we just pass the um, anniversary of Apollo 8 circling the moon, and also the last mission to the moon was December 17th, 1972, but Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility right about uh, here, where I'm pointing in the lower left area of the Sea of Tranquility, roughly around here. So interesting enough. Okay, so now let's take this moon and put it up in the sky. 
And what you can see here is the moon is hanging out with Jupiter. And again, this is the 18th. This is about 7 o'clock at night. And again, the moon is not full. It's about that quarter. It's that image that I just showed you. But it's hanging out near Jupiter. So another great evening to be able to find the planet uh, Jupiter. And then we have the planet Uranus, which you cannot see at naked eye, particularly when the moon is handed uh, so close. But it's an easy binocular object. And you can notice that between Jupiter and the Pleiades, the star cluster here, we talked a little bit about last month, uh, is where Uranus is located. So get yourself online. You can get a, a, a star map with planets in Uranus. You may have some good luck to find it with binoculars. It's at a magnitude, uh, excuse me, a magnitude 5.7, which in theory is naked eye on a dark, clear, ideal night. But uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. Binoculars will bring it into view. OK, so Jupiter and the moon are hanging out. And I want to sh show you uh, the artwork here. And there's some other things that we can look at. So we have. Uh, Jupiter, this is the Pleiades that I mentioned on the shoulders of Taurus the bull. Aldebaran is the eye of the bull, and it's a magnitude one star, or an orange star. And then very famous, we have Orion. And uh, Tyler showed us early er, the Orion Nebula, which is right here. And you can just make it out uh, naked eye, hanging below Orion's belt, and I love to say those star names of the belt, Al-Natak, Al-Nalam, and Mintaka. Mintaka actually means belt in uh, Arabic. And hanging below the belt is the sheath for the sword, and that's where Orion's nebula is found, uh, M44. And you notice that uh, Orion is holding over his head the, the sword, and the armpit is Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse means armpit of the great hunter. And Betelgeuse is a red star. It's a cool star. Aldebaran being orange is a little bit warmer. And Rigel, the lower right star of Orion, is a hot white blue star. And those are really hot stars. And it's about a magnitude uh, zero. So Orion, pretty easy to find. And if you take Orion's belt and you go upwards, you find Aldebaran. Easy enough. It's fairly bright, so magnitude 1. But then if you take Orion's belt and you go downwards, pretty much following that straight line of the belt, downwards, you come down to Sirius. And I'm serious about that. And Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky, glowing at about a negative 1.44 magnitude. So it's the brightest star in the night sky of either hemisphere, north or southern hemisphere. And Cirrus is also referred to sometimes as the dog star, because it's in the constellation of Canis Major, uh, the big dog. And if you go diagonally from Rigel through Betelgeuse, you're going to go up by diagonally, and you're going to come to the twin stars, Castor, which is not labeled here, and Pollux. Pollux and Castor are the twin stars. And you see Gemini, the twins. And then you notice, well, there's a little dog here. Procyon is also pretty bright. And that is a little dog star. And then you have Cirrus, Procyon, Castor and Pollux are the twins. We have Aldebaran, the eye of the bull. We have Orion. Betelgeuse is the armpit of the great hunter, red star, cool. Rigel, blue, white, very hot, representing Orion's left foot, but the bottom right star as we look at it. And so great things to be able to see uh, in the night sky. Next, uh, I just want to show you the stars without the artwork, because when you go outside to look up, you know, we don't provide the artwork for you. We haven't figured out how to project that on your backyard night sky. But see if you can find it. Start with Orion. Take Orion's belt. Follow it upwards to Aldebaran. Bright orange star. Not quite as bright as Betelgeuse. And then if you take Orion's belt and you go downwards, you come down to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, either hemisphere. 
And then if you go diagonal from Rigel through Betelgeuse, it's going to take you up to the twin stars, Castor and Pollux. Castor is the upper one, and Pollux is the lower one. And Pollux is just a tad, tad brighter than Castor is. And then in between Pollux and Sirius, the other bright star that you see, which is to the left of Orion, as you look at Orion, is Procyon, the little dog star. So lots of things to look at and enjoy in the night sky. And so um, stay tuned. We're going to, I'm going to introduce to you Tyler Flanagan, and we're going to be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. So I hope you enjoyed that star talk and enjoy going out and looking at the night sky. Let me introduce Tyler to you. Well, at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Tyler Flanagan. Tyler is the treasurer for the Belmont High School Astronomy Club. Uh, welcome to the show once again, Tyler. Welcome to be here. Yeah, uh, yeah I've been on it once before. It's pretty fun. You have, yeah, it is. It's a, it's a ball. There's never a dull moment on the sky this month. And uh, just noticing uh, the sweatshirt you're wearing, what is that image that uh, is on the front? That is a solar eclipse. and. In 2024, April 8th, there is one, actually, once-in-a-lifetime experience, so uh, you don't want to miss that. And that's going to be uh, for New Hampshire up in Coas County. Uh, we'll be talking more. We have talked about it. We'll be talking about it more as the time comes. So as I already mentioned, behind us, you see this uh, plethora, of, plethora of galaxies. And every point of light you see, from the big ones that may obviously look like galaxies, to the small pinpoints and the faint fuzzy spots, they're all galaxies. Uh, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. But there's a, a new spaceship, a new telescope on the block, so to speak, the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, Tyler is going to get us into what's the latest and the greatest with a little bit of introductory history about the James Webb Space Telescope. So. Take it away, Tyler. All right, so on December 25th of 2021, at about 7.20 a.m., uh, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched with Ariane 5, which was provided to the U.S. with, um, or by the European Space Agency to the U.S. with a fundless exchange. Uh, it was launched out of Kourou, it's near the equator, which gives additional push because of the spin of the, of the Earth, so that and, launched it further. And Earth is spinning, a uh, thousand thirty seven miles an hour at the equator, so the closer you are to the equator as Earth spins, you get that extra push, which, right. which is nice. Right. Three miles per hour. Uh, so the first light, the James Webb Space Telescope has a camera function on it that allows it to take a spectrum of every galaxy in the field of view. Um, some scientists showed that the bubbles of transparent ionized gas seen in the spectrum were in the exact location of the star-forming galaxies seen by the James Webb Space Telescope. So this, is, uh, this supports the idea that ordinary galaxies did most of the work clearing the space around them. Uh, these are some amazing things that we've learned uh, about and from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it's observed four of the most distant galaxies known, which means they are the oldest. Uh, Webb observed the galaxies as they appeared about 13.4 billion years ago, when the universe is only 2% of its current age. Um, we've discovered the first direct images of exoplanets. Uh, I think last time I was on here, I was talking about those, actually, right, yes. ironic enough. And uh, there are over 3,000 of them known, and only about two dozen have been observed. Since the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope used infrared, unlike the Hubble, it can see straight through the dust and the clouds of whatever you want to look at. And uh, it, we've seen intense star clusters being formed as galaxies collide into each other. And, and that is one of the strong points of the James Webb Space Telescope is its ability to see through that gas and dust, whereas uh, Hubble is mostly right. looking at visible light. That's what separates them. Yeah. Uh, on March 11th, the final stage of alignment called fine phasing was completed. Uh, at this point, every parameter, uh, optical, every lens has been tested and checked and at, is at or above the expectations we thought they would meet. There are no blockages or objects in the way of the telescope, so it's free to just take pictures for us, really. Which is really nice. 
So uh, Tyler, tell us, where is the James Webb Space Telescope? So I think people think that it is on an orbit around the Earth, but that is not true. It's actually on an orbit around the Sun. Uh, it's at something called the Second Lagrange Point, or L2, and it lets it stay in line with Earth while the heat shield protects it from the heat and light of the Sun, Earth and the Moon. So it's really, it's not going to overheat. It's not going to get, you know, glares ultimately, but yeah. And we can see how far away it is, too. The moon is about a quarter million miles away, and uh, the Webb Space Telescope is uh, just about uh, a million miles away. About more than triple, yeah. Yeah, more than triple, which are just about four times. And so whereas we had, uh, when we had the space shuttle missions, we could go up to the Hubble Space Telescope and make uh, some changes or some repair missions, of which there were four. Uh, so Webb is basically on its own. Uh, amazing that it has worked as well as it has, but uh, there's no repair missions possible. So good luck, Mr. James Webb. <laughs> uh, so these are the pillars of creation. Uh, they're pretty infamous because this is one of the more popular photos taken by the Hubble. And as you can, that picture on the right is actually taken by the Hubble telescope. And in a few slides, I'll, uh, I'll show you what the James Webb Space Telescope picture of the Pillars of Creation look like. And I think you'll notice it's a pretty big difference. So here are some pictures of Biden. Uh, so that's it right on the left there. I think you can really see how more defined and, and vibrant this telescope really makes every image it takes. Uh, but basically, the Pillars of Creation are elephant trunks of interstellar gas and dust located near the uh, Eagle Eye uh, Nebula, about six or 7,000 light years away from Earth, so it's pretty far. And uh, on the right there, that is Jupiter. I'm sure you've seen Jupiter you know, photos before, and you think it's like this tan, kind of Tatooine-looking planet from Star Wars, but it's got that kind of green glow to it, I guess, and I, I think that really caught a lot of people off guard. And the uh, Pillars of Creation, you notice that on the Pillars of Creation, we see a lot more through it than with the Hubble. Like it almost looks like uh, James Webb has, uh, yeah, because of the infrared, it almost like has X-ray vision <laughs> to be able to see through it. So here are some more pictures that we've seen. I think these were some of the cooler ones. Uh, this is called the Cartwheel Galaxy. It's a lenticular ring galaxy about 500 million light years away uh, in the constellation Sculptor. Um, it has a diameter of 44.23 kiloparsecs. It was discovered by Fritz Zwicky in uh, 1941. And uh, a kiloparsec, obviously, uh, you, you know that a kilo means a thousand. And a parsec is 3.26 light years. So you take uh, 3.26, multiply that by 44, and then multiply that by a thousand, so you can see that it's a pretty it's a hefty. Of, it's a lot of light years. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of in, light years uh, in diameter. Yes. Um, so the one on the right, you know a little a little less about, but it's called Herbig Harrow two one one. It's basically an outflow of a young star. Um, things like this are formed when jets of gas spewing from a newborn star form a shock wave colliding with nearby gas and dust at insanely high speeds and just makes this beautiful, I don't even know what to call it, just a, an image. <laughs> yeah, and you can definitely, I think, see the, uh, the outflow from this uh, young star. It's, uh, and again, once another amazing picture from James Webb. Uh, this picture is cool to me. So the one on the right is the Hubble. You can see how you know, it, it's pretty fuzzy if you really look at it and um, kind of unclear. And then the one on the left is a James Webb Space Telescope. And you can just, you can see every minor detail really. What's minor to us, I guess. But you can, again, you can see kind of right through it. And uh, that's the, the infrared coming in. I might make a, a comment on the, uh, a comment, not a comment, <laughs> of the image on the right. So uh, at the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center, which I, again, I would just put in a plug. So every first Friday night of every month, so this would be uh, January 5th, we have a special program 
uh, at the McCall Shepherd Discovery Center. Check it out at starhop, S-T-A-R-H-O-P dot com. Uh, we, th this image on the right is, uh, as uh, Tyler said, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And there was an opportunity to apply for high resolution images that were like uh, uh, something like a three foot by four foot big image. And the McCall Shepherd Discovery Center, we earned, I'd say, the right to have one of those images. So you can see that image on the right in big format. Uh, and you, you can walk right up to it and uh, touch it and look at it and see the amazing uh, detail. But as Tyler said, looking at these two together, it, it does look uh, you know, a little fuzzy when you see the image on the left and the detail taken by James Webb. Now, this is a picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy, which we affectionately know as M51. And it's in the constellation of Canis Vanatissi, uh, the hunting dogs, and which is a little bit below uh, the Big Dip, well, I guess depending upon the time of night, uh, it's a little bit below the crook of the handle of uh, the Big Dipper is where it is. And it's about the same size of our galaxy. Uh, it's about 109,000 light years in diameter. Our galaxy is a little more than 100,000 light years. And uh, also, uh, another claim to fame is this was the first galaxy that was actually categorized as a spiral galaxy. But uh, as Tyler pointed out, on the left, you know, you can see amazingly uh, how much the detail you can see versus the Hubble, which we thought was really good. But now it's, uh, it's even better. Might have to uh, update that picture at the Chris McCullough Museum. Yes, maybe they'll have a contest or something that we can get a James Webb Space Telescope picture. That'd be cool. Yeah, it would. Updating with the times. Uh, so this is a, a cool picture I found. Um, it's called Stefan's Quintet. Um, it's a group of five galaxies about 270 million light years away from Earth. Uh, so again, all these are going to be really, really far away. Um, this group provides a pristine laboratory for the study of galaxies and the collisions and what they, what kind of impact they have on the environments around them. I have uh, a fairly large picture of this that I won actually at the main star party a couple of summers ago. We had a trivia contest. There was about a 40 or so amateur astronomers there, and uh, I got in the top three. So I uh, won one of these pictures and. There were several to choose from, and I chose Stefan's Quintet. So good pick. Stefan's Quintet is very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so this one's really cool. This is the Orion Nebula. You can see this from Earth uh, pretty well. Uh, those three stars on the bottom left, I think that's known as Orion's Belt. You can mm -hmm. pick that out pretty easily. It's three stars right in a line. And uh, in a little bit, I'm going to show uh, well, you remember from looking at Orion, I showed you below his belt where the Orion Nebula actually is. And if you have binoculars, it's uh, pretty cool to look at the Orion Nebula with binoculars. And if you have a telescope, a small telescope, it's uh, very cool to take a, a nice close look at uh, the Orion Nebula. So um, I think. Uh, Anything else you want to add about the James Webb Space Telescope, Tyler? Well, pictures are always coming out, so you know, keep keep on the eye for those. Uh, beautiful pictures like the ones uh, we just showed you are really always coming out, so just keep an eye out for that, and I'm excited for the future. And uh, have you heard, um, are there any issues technologically, operationally, mechanically going on with the Space Telescope? I haven't heard about any major ones, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think it's good. <laughs> It's very good because, as uh, I mentioned, there's no, we're not going to be able to have any repair missions. <laughs> You're right, yeah. To go up, go up there. What so we have is what we have. It is, and uh, it's supposed to be about a last for about ten years, and one of the reasons for that is it does have a limited amount uh, of fuel on board. It doesn't need a lot of fuel because it's in, as Tyler mentioned, that Lagrange two point, in a Lagrange point. The way the gravity works, it allows it just 
to kind of hang out there, relying on the gravity from uh, the sun, Earth, and the moon. Uh, but it just needs a little bit of propulsion to have a little bit of an orbit uh, in that area. And, but when the fuel runs out, which is 10 to 12 years or so, then we're not going to be able to control it uh, anymore. And uh, we'll just be left to its own devices, so to speak. But it should be, it would seem like it's going to be success, 10 to 12 years of successful images. And I'm pretty sure the Hubble lasted longer than they thought it would, too. So, Yes, very, very much longer. And Hubble is another, our space telescope, still doing great work. Uh, but uh, when it meets its demise, uh, there's nothing we're going to be able to do about that either. Because even though that's not very far up, so to speak, it's only 400, only 400 miles up, about twice as far up as the International Space Station. Uh, but we just don't have any way to get there anymore. Since the <laughs> shuttle program uh, ended, uh, we just can't get there. So uh, good luck, Hubble. Keep on going. <laughs> but one of the nice things that has typically been true over the past decades is whatever NASA has built has lasted longer yep. than expected. Right, which is, again, a good thing. And. Uh, you know, we, we could talk about the Mars rovers, spared an opportunity. You know, they were hoping to get 90 days was the plan. They were hoping, praying on their knees, could we please get 120 days out of both spirit and opportunity? And they both exceeded six years. Uh, it's crazy. The, uh, we know of the Perseverance rover on Mars, and it had uh, ingenuity as the helicopter uh, under its belly. And uh, they were hoping that this helicopter would make five successful short flights. And NASA would be thrilled. Well, we're, we're well over 50 flights. <laughs> and uh, so uh, NASA has been very fortunate with their partners, JPL Laboratory and the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins. and. Uh, that have been building these spacecrafts that have just done an extraordinary job of exceeding expectations. So Tyler, thank you so much for uh, being with us on the show. No problem. And thanks for the research you put into the James Webb Space Telescope and enlightening on some of its greatest uh, recent pictures and images and discoveries. My pleasure. All right. Well, thank thanks you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And we're we're sure to have you back another time. Sure, definitely. Okay. Well, uh, that about wraps it up. And I thank everybody for joining us on the sky this month. And uh, remember, the greatest show on earth, it's found in your backyard. Just keep looking up. I'm Dave McDonald for the sky this month.